Um, don't worry. <laughs> I'll be nice. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, I'm really sorry, but I don't speak any Swedish, uh, so we have to do it in English. Uh, if you don't get it, or uh, if you don't understand what I mean, just shout. Uh, any good question will be rewarded with a bar of chocolate, so it's definitely an invitation to, uh, to ask questions. Can you swap the presentation? Um, it was okay. My daughter, she's 10, Bente, and um, Thies, uh, she's, he's eight. They said, well, it's okay, Daddy, if you go to Sweden to talk about chocolate. But it's important that you let people know who you are. And to them, I'm the boss of chocolate. And for kids in the age of 10, there's no greater job than your father being the boss of chocolate. So when I pick him up from primary school, there's always a kid running up to me and saying, are you really the boss of chocolate? And yes, I'm really the boss of chocolate. That means if something goes wrong, then it's my fault. I want to be a boss that lays a fundament on which people can flourish. And um, I want my team to, to do things that other people cannot do. And for that, you need respect. So I want to build a layer of fundament, uh, a fundament of respect on which people can actually do things that they would never imagine they could do. That's the kind of boss that I'd like to be. And then you have the feeling, now it's time to print business cards. I hate business cards. Because then you're not hanky honka anymore. Um, so we don't have business cards and we have funny job titles. My job title is Chief Chocolate Officer. Makes people smile and people understand immediately that I'm not taking myself too seriously. Because I do take my job very serious, but I don't take myself too seriously. I have to listen to my kids, otherwise I don't get a pride feeling. And pride is my thrive. I want to build everything that I have on um, building a thrive. And I want to be proud of the work that I do and that we do. So that's uh, why we, uh, we work hard at Tony Stoccoloni. I acquired the company uh, five years ago. I used to work at Heineken. And selling beer to guys is similar to selling chocolate to girls. So it's actually doing two times the same job. Um, in the meantime, I was responsible for Innocent Drinks. Innocent Drinks is a fruit juice, a smoothie. Um, I was responsible for the, uh, the Benelux. It's Belgium, Netherlands, and Luxembourg. Um, and that's a little bit of my background. I like to do a lot of talks on universities because I think the bright people make me smarter. I'm not that smart myself, so you have to help me. Um, so that's the reason for being here. Let's go shopping together. If you do shopping, and women know this, but the guys don't know, you go to a supermarket, you buy everything that you need. Your food, your drinks, your cosmetics, um, and your cleaning materials. And once you've collected all the stuff that you need and put it into your basket, then you go to the cashier. And just before you go to the cashier, you look and you see chocolate and you walk through. Women know this. You already bought one. It's not in your, uh, your uh, carriage yet. So you go back, you grab one, you put it into your uh, carriage, and then all the groceries goes on a conveyor belt to the cashier. Chocolate is last in your basket, goes aside, all the groceries go on the conveyor belt, and then finally you close off with chocolate. All groceries goes into your shopping bag, and you buy either you walk home or you cycle home or you take the car home. If the chocolate bar looks at you from the top of all the groceries, it takes two stoplights, and you think, oh, what the heck, one bite. So you open it. Before you get home, golden wrapper. You open it, and my mouth already starts watering. 
have that feeling. I don't need the calories. My bum is fat enough. But damn, I love it. And good chocolate has a, has a shine. It shines and has a crisp snap. Let's see whether it works. And you take a piece. And when you take that piece, it starts melting on your tongue. And you realize that the smallest particles in your tongue are exactly the same size as the smaller particles in chocolate. And you get that film over your tongue. And that's the feeling you dream about, right? It's a French kiss of food. That's what chocolate is. You don't need it. You want it. It's a present for yourself or a present to somebody else. But chocolate is always a present. And it's my role and my responsibility to make sure you can give the present to somebody else without any second thought. So, if you go to chocolate, chocolate is being made of uh, cocoa, sugar, sometimes milk powder, and sometimes soya lecithin. It's a really nice process. And if you look at cocoa, cocoa is being produced around the equator. So Middle America, Western Africa, and Southeast Asia. And 70% of the annual production of cocoa comes from Ivory Coast, Ghana, Togo Benin, Nigeria, Cameroon. Those countries in Western Africa. They produce 70% of all cocoa being worldwide produced. Ghana and Ivory Coast alone, two countries, produce 55% of the annual production of cocoa. Two countries. 2.3 million farmers. 1.6 million children are working on these f f farms. 1.6 million children. Of the kids working in the field, in English there's a distinction between child labor and child work. And child work is doing legal stuff after school, and child work is doing illegal stuff and or instead of going to school. And we're against the illegal version of work. Because I think that you want to enjoy chocolate without the second thought of slavery. And we call that slavery. The United Nations calls it worst forms of child labor. Like there are any good forms of child labor. Bullshit. And if you realize that eating chocolate and getting a bigger bum and getting a French kiss of food and making your own kids pride at primary school, proud at primary school, influence the lives in Western Africa, then I think, what is the world that we're living in? How separated is the world? Those farmers, they sell their uh, crop to multinationals. And yes, we do sell some bars in Sweden, but I wouldn't call Tony's a multinational yet. But big companies, companies like Cargill, ADM, uh, Barry Callebaut, and they sell women's dream. They sell 40,000 liters of liquid chocolate. A truckload full. You can actually swim in the in chocolate. And they sell it to companies like Mars, Nestle, Mondelez. Mondelez is the uh, mother company of Maribu, and May, and Cadbury. Those five companies make products that we all consume every day. And if you don't consume chocolate every day, let's agree to start doing it tomorrow, okay? So you have on the first, you have the business to business suppliers, and on the other hand, you have the, the branded manufacturers of chocolate. Together, and you, it's economically incorrect, but together, they have a market share of over 100%. You cannot add two, two uh, different steps in the value chain and add them up together, but if you would, that all chocolate worldwide being produced goes either through the hands of one of these or through the hands of one of these. And a lot of chocolate goes to both the hands. So those eight companies are in, in the middle, and then you and me, we're on the other, uh, other hand. So it's an hourglass, right? Millions of farmers, eight big companies, and then billions of consumers. And of a bar that you can buy in store for 35 Swedish crowns, it's being sold to a consumer 
the cocoa farmer receives of the milk chocolate only 1.1 Swedish crown. And yes, it contains milk powder and it contains sugar. And only 30% of the content of this is actually from the cocoa farmer. But the cocoa farmer receives only 1.1 Swedish crown. And is that mean? No. Cannot say that's mean. Is that illegal? No, it's not illegal. Is it unfair? Yeah. To me, it's definitely unfair. And it's definitely unequally shared. And why is it that the beginning of any value chain is poor, while the end of a value chain is rich? And the moment we realize that you get more money at the end of a value chain, the rich people get richer and the poor people get poorer. And I think it's time that we take our responsibility serious and see how we can share wealth more evenly over the world. And stop calling the third world the third world. It's not the third world. 70% 70, 70 of the people live in the third world. It's the majority world. And if you don't care for the majority world, then you don't care for the world, right? So we have to take serious action. And we're against modern slavery. And if you say that, it makes sense. It's logical. Everyone is. Nobody is proud of slavery. And still, there are more slaves working in the world today than any period in time before. And we think that we have, uh, we got rid of slavery. It's untrue. We just moved it, moved it to the world. It takes you about five to six hours to fly there, but you don't see, look at it, you don't see it. And whether it's mining, it's fishing, it's tobacco, it's uh, cotton, it's chocolate, uh, uh, cocoa, it's sex. A lot of industries are actually, the base of the pyramid is poor. And within the base of the pyramid, 35.5 million people are working illegally today. And that problem has to be taken seriously. And it can be done by a company. It's not that an NGO makes the world a better place and a company makes money. Now you can make money and make the world a better place. So what we do is we fight against slavery. And any form of forced work with or without pay, but it's illegal. So the child labor is the illegal form of child work and child labor. And you know what a definition like this does? It talks to your brain. And if you want to change something, you don't have to talk to your brain. And we're all smart people, we know how the brain works, right? You rationalize things. But if you want to change things, you have to talk to the gut. Because if your feeling is hurt, then you will change. And otherwise you will rationalize, yeah, what, what am I? What can I do? There's nothing that I can change in the system. You don't need to change the whole system. Just a little bit, and the world will become a nicer place. And if you want a definition to talk to your gut, you need somebody to tell the story. So I brought some people. The film is in Dutch. No, it's in French, subtitled in Dutch. If you don't speak French and you can't read Dutch, then I'll translate it to you. Je m'appelle Kam Tugé, 18 ans. J'étais travaillé dans la plantation de cacao. Je m'appelle Kam Koué Herman. J'ai 18 ans. J'ai travaillé à la plantation de cacao 1999 en 2003. Je suis Kam Samé Félix. J'ai 16 ans. J'ai travaillé dans une plantation de cacao de 1999 en 2003. Je n'étais pas payé. J'étais forcé de travailler. J'étais forcé de travailler. Je n'avais pas la liberté pour quitter les coins. On ne m'a pas payé. On m'a forcé de travailler. Je ne peux pas quitter de laisser le travail aussi. On m'a forcé de travailler. Et je n'avais pas le droit de quitter la plantation. C'est fini, madame C'est fini. Ah. Ok. Voilà. Ik ga die uit. 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 Ik ga die uit.
These kids are real. They're 18 years old. They had to work on a plantation. They were not allowed to leave, didn't get any money, were forced to work. If they didn't listen, they got beaten. And if you had too much pain in the ass, you got killed. You could buy a child for 200 to 300 euros, like a tool, and then it's yours. By the time the 11 year old bo a boy that you just bought turned 18 and is stronger than a farmer, the farmer lets him go. This happens not a lot, 90,000 times. 90,000 children are being sold to work on cocoa plantation, plantations alone. And if you go back with me to the primary school of Bente, and you see the kids running up to me, are you the boss of chocolate? How should I feel? Am I in charge of this? This is not that I want to be proud of. And if you've seen this, then you realize in your gut something has to change. Let's see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I touched it twice, so it might, it might not. Ah. <laughs> Technique. Um, what you saw in the film uh, was Tone from the Keuken. And Tony from the Kitchen uh, is a Dutch uh, a journalist. And Tone from the Keuken is a Dutch journalist. And he presents a TV show on what do marketeers want you to believe and what, do they, what stories do they tell to you so that you buy their product in the supermarket. So it's mostly food products. And he makes a show for 13 years. For instance, if you go to a supermarket in Amsterdam and you buy vanilla yogurt, then the vanilla yogurt is made of yogurt, sugar, and vanilla, if you're lucky. And if you're not lucky, then it's being made of yogurt, sugar, and vanillin. And vanillin is being made of a Christmas tree, if you're lucky. And if you're not lucky, then it's not made of a Christmas tree, but it's still vanillin, and you, we, we call it vanilla because vanilla is more expensive. People are willing to pay for vanilla yogurt. It can be made of yeast as well, if you're lucky. And if you're not lucky and you buy the cheapest version, then there is a chance that it's being made of the testicles of a beaver that's dried and grinded, and it tastes exactly like vanillin, and you put it in yogurt with sugar, and you can sell it as vanilla yogurt in Holland. But actually, you're eating the balls of a beaver. Um, that's the kind of TV show that he makes. So by the year 2004, he started looking. Oh, hang on. I uh, pressed it twice. So let's go one slide back. In the year 2001, two senators from the US State Senate came together and they said, we have to change something. We have to teach the guys within the industry that they have to take their responsibility seriously. Senator Harkin and Engel came together in the year 2001 to draw up a self-regulating uh, initiative, the Harkin and Engel Protocol, for the chocolate industry. Within 10 years, we will make sure that there's no worse forms of child labor in the category anymore. And all the big guys signed. So if you go online, you can find the PDF. It's a five or six page document with five or six pages of signatures. And everyone signed. Mars, Nestle, Hershey, Mondelez, May, but also Barry Callebaut, uh, Cargill, and ADM. All the big guys, they all signed it. And by the year 2004, so three, three and a half years after signing the Harkin Engel Protocol, Tone van der Keuken, he went to Barry Callebaut the biggest chocolate maker in the world, a Belgian company. Asking them, how far are you? You're three years down the line of the Hark and Engel protocol. What initiatives have you done? And what are the results of eliminating all worst forms of child labor from the chocolate chain? Getting rid of all slavery. And Barry Kalaba didn't want to talk to him. 
because he was this annoying journalist asking the questions that they didn't want to talk about. And then he went to Vevey. Vevey is a beautiful place on the lake of uh, Geneva between the Alps and right in the middle of Vevey there's the headquarters of Nestlé. You can look through the headquarters of uh, Nestlé and, and you see the beautiful picture of the Alps and, and Lake Geneva. And there was a press person running out saying, Mr. van der Keuken, how are you? And he said, that's nice, there's a better uh, uh, way of receiving a journalist than at the Barry Callebaut. Yeah, but we're not going to talk. You're not going to talk? No, we're not going to talk. Why not? Uh, Barry Callebaut phoned us and you are a pain in the ass, so we're not going to talk. But you can have coffee. And Chen was furious. And he thought, how can I make a TV program if nobody wants to talk to me? And what he did is he find a parallel. And in Amsterdam, you can buy a bike. You can get, go to a shop and buy a bike, or you can go to a junkie and buy a bike. If you go to a junkie who lives in a park and sells a bike uh, in a park, then there's a limited chance that it's actually a certified bike mechanic. It's probably a stolen bike. But we have more bikes than people in Amsterdam, so if you ask people, nobody does it. But if you ask the junkie, then he sells more bikes than, than you can imagine. So buying a bike of a junkie is illegal. We, it's called fencing. Because if you think you know that bike is stolen, and if that bike is stolen, that's a criminal act, you cannot fund a criminal act by buying that bike, called fencing. Then if you go to a supermarket, and you know that there's slavery going on at a large scale, then buying chocolate is illegal, right? Because earlier on in the value chain of cocoa, something illegal happened, slavery. You're aware of that, so you can never ever buy chocolate again, legally. So Tone thought, it's time to turn me in. He bought 10 bars, called 911, and said, I did something criminal. I'm a chocolate criminal, you have to come and pick me up. So long short story short, in First Amendment, the judge didn't want to convict him. Then he went in appeal, and in Second Amendment, he was um, being taken to court, and he actually said, I can bring you some slaves. So what you saw in the film was the, uh, uh, the prosecution of Tone being filmed, and Kamko Herman came to uh, the Netherlands to testify in court. And Tone was sent free. You know why? Because they couldn't prove that the cocoa being picked by Kamko Herman was actually eaten by Tone. So there was no causality between the illegal labor and the consumption of a chocolate bar. And if there's no causality, then there's no case. So Tone was a free man. And then you think, if the industry signs but doesn't do anything and doesn't want to talk about it, if the judge doesn't want to help us, how am I going to change the world as a journalist? So he went to the Chamber of Commerce and he started Tony's Chocoloni. Tony's, his name, Tone, Chocoloni, his lonely battle against the chocolate industry to change it for the better. And he made the red bar. And I could tell you, he's a horrible business person, he's a nice guy. He's a pain in the ass sometimes, but he's a nice guy. But he's a horrible business person. I took over the company now four and a half years ago. And I'm going to Ghana and seeing with my own eyes what it means to kids to work there, I realized something had to change. It's not a marketing trick. It's not something like selling beer to guys is similar to selling chocolate to girls. No. I don't want to sell chocolate. I want to change chocolate. And Anita Roddick, she's the founder of the body shop. I have great admiration for her. She died far too young. And she always says, if you think you're too small to have an impact, try going to bed with a mosquito in the room. That's a completely different night, right? You wake up, it zooms, it stings, you cannot find it, 
lights go on, you go back to bed, lights go off again, and then if you're lucky, after six times of sting, then you you enter the of uh, you lit the lights again, and you find it, and you create your own piece of architecture on your white wall with your own blood. We are the mosquito. We are this tiny, annoying chocolate bastard that zooms and stings at times the big guys want us to shut up. Because we think it's our role that we have to play to make the nights for them as horrible as possible until they change. And they can change. So that's an inspiration quote that, that keeps me awake all the time. We're crazy about chocolate and serious about people. We're not completely wappy. No, we're dedicated and passionate to make the best tasting chocolate in the whole wide world. And we're serious if we talk about five kinds of people. Firstly, our own team. I slipped through, but apart from me, we really have good people working at Tony's. People who are more motivated than anybody else. And if you have good people that are more motivated than anybody else, then you win the race, right? She so does have to outsmart competition. That's the way it works. We do funny things as well. So at the beginning of the year, you get sneakers. So you can start running. And you get free chocolate during the year. And at the end of the year, you have to go for your BMI bonus. See whether your body mass index is still okay. And if you go on a scale and your body mass index is still okay, you receive money. If you ate too much or run too little, then you don't get the money. Innovation needs to be rewarded, right? So if you make a kit, you receive 1,000 euro netto. And that goes for both parents that work at our place. So at Friday night drinks, it's more interesting to make a kit with your colleague than with somebody else because it's more financially beneficial. You receive both 1,000 euros. And that makes the Friday night drinks more interesting, I can tell you. We've been elected as the best employer of the Netherlands two years ago. And that, to me, that means something. If you have a bunch of people who is motivated and committed to actually win the race, and make fun with each other, not to be too seriously uh, on the one hand, but be really serious on the other hand about people. Secondly is the farmer. We put the farmer on the second place. We have long-term relationship with the farmer, traceable cocoa in our uh, product. We pay him 25% more over the farm gate price. We work on quality and on quantity, so they have to produce more to get more income. So we work with them to produce more of a higher quality. And we work with them to organize them in a, in a way that they are stronger talking to multinationals than they were when they, uh, when they didn't enter a, a cooperative. On third place, we put the consumer. And most marketing companies that work for consumers put consumer first. But if they realize why we put the consumer in the third place, then they get it. And they're okay with that. We've been elected as the best marketing company of the Netherlands. That's nice, but it doesn't mean anything. Because we're not a marketing company. I don't give a shit about brand image. But I, I'm worried about reality, right? So the only thing that we do is open up the windows and let people look in like a real company. If you go to Amsterdam, come and visit us. If you're in the office, you're not allowed to leave unless you take a bar. So it's beneficial for you to, to come. On the fourth place is the customer. So the ICA and the co-op and other customers that might sell our bars pretty soon. Because if you have the right customers who get it and the right consumers who get it, then you make headway and if you make headway, you can make change. And that's everything that we want. We want to make change. And you need good people around you, like a printer or a chocolate maker. Because we don't make chocolate ourselves. Barry about the biggest chocolatier in the whole wide world, makes a couverture. Working with them gives us influence to influence them to make sustainable chocolate. 
and together with the, uh, with Barikalabad and two factories who make the bars, we produce Tonys and a marketing agency and a printer and some other people that that supply us. So all our supply is on the fifth place. So we're serious about people. We're serious about five kind of people, our own team, the farmer, the consumer, the customer, and uh, uh, finally the supplier. And ain't it strange that all bars are equally shared and look like this, while the world is so unequally shared? So we've changed the bar. And it's unequally divided. And then people start phoning us. You made a strange bar. Because I took one piece and there was a splinter of chocolate that fell on my skirt and it made it stained. Who's going to pay for that? Well, I said, well, we didn't do it. Yeah, but you made it unequally shared. Yeah, that's because of the message. The world is unequally shared and you have to show that. And if you put the message inside of the product, then it, it, you're stronger communicating the message. So that's why we've done it. And we only took one piece, Tony's Chocolate Only. It's the biggest piece, but we like the logo. And if you look closely, and you're smart people, you've seen that already, of, of course, Western Africa is inside of the bar. Ivory Coast, Ghana, Togo Benin, Nigeria, Cameroon, and the bottom of the bar is the equator. So the whole story of Tony's is intrinsic in the bar. So the moment you unwrap it and Tony's is naked on your saloon table, then the story is there. And we invite you to tell that story and to share the bar with somebody else because it's a big bar. If you look at the middle piece, oh, this piece. Two countries, Togo and Benin. Two separate countries. And I know you don't like nuts here in the facility, but I do like hazelnuts in my, uh, uh, my chocolate. Whole, big hazelnuts. And it didn't fit Togo, nor Benin. And if you merge the two countries together, then a whole hazelnut could actually fit in. So then we had a discussion in the office. Who would win? Politics or the hazelnut? The hazelnut won. So we merged the two countries and we decided never ever to tell them in Western Africa. So, so this bit now can contain a hazelnut. It doesn't because it's not allowed here. But we do have bars with hazelnuts. There is a problem in the world. And the problem is poverty. And one of the outcomes of poverty is slavery. And we have to open our eyes. And we have to communicate the problem. Because nobody, nobody, not even the people working at Mona Lisa Mars, do want this. So we have to take our responsibility and make sure that we make the world a nicer place. But before you can take your responsibility, you have to exactly know what's going on. So creating awareness is really important. Secondly, you have to build a company that does it different and knows what going, uh, what's going on and shows positive impact and results. It's not about resources that you put behind uh, social sustainability. No, it's the impact that you make. That's really important. So I would say we lead by example. It's not of us that we are a commercial company that wants to make money. No, we are a commercial company that wants to make bring results. And we call that the rocking chair test. When you're old and in the elderly home and look back on your working life, then money doesn't count anymore. But soon, one day you'll die and you have to give away the money. You cannot take that with you. What you can take with you is your pride, your own feeling. 
And if you start looking back on your life, then you realize that taking a shortcut for money is never ever going to make you proud in the end. And if you work for your pride in the end, then you'll be car playing cards in the elderly home with a big smile. You know you won the race. It's not about money. It's about pride. And if you know that it's about pride, then you have to have a company where it's illegal to take a shortcut, although it's better for the money. It feels like a shortcut and you feel it in your, in, in your stomach. So it's important never ever to take a shortcut and to realize that every decision, how small the decision might, might look, should make you a little bit prider, more proud when you're in the elderly home. And what we hope is that we can influence the big guys to take their responsibility too. Because alone we cannot change chocolate. We work with 5,000 farmers of the 2 million worldwide. It's only 5,000. And yes, we have I direct impact on 30,000 people's lives. That's a lot. But still, it's one zip um, uh, in a whole ocean. So what I think is important, to inspire them, to zoom and to sting, to motivate them to actually come to action and to change, inspire them to, to act. And sometimes we're this, this tiny Greenpeace boat telling them what to do. We're the business activist shouting at them. And sometimes we're the guide that moves the big ships around and says, well, follow us. We know what we're doing. So that's why we write the annual fair report and we put it online. With everything that we do, every mistake that we made, so everything that we do is inside. So competition can read everything that we do and can learn from us. That means that we have to be quick. Otherwise, we are just a blood stain on the wall of their bedroom. We have to move and make impact. Because the only thing that we want to achieve is 100% slave-free chocolate. And it's not us who makes slave-free chocolate. It's us together. Together we can make slave-free chocolate. You have to work together. And it's strange. If you look at competition in a way, no, you cannot see anything from me. They can see everything from us. We invite competition over and go to Africa together. We teach them what we know on chocolate. And we're just a tiny team. But we're motivated to actually make it happen. To make chocolate 100% slave free. It's not our chocolate, it's all chocolate in the whole wide world. And having that aim and that purpose gives you a, a team that is stronger and committed than anybody else. And if you have bright people who are committed and stronger than anybody else, then you win. It's quite easy. Just make sure they work hard, but not too hard. Thanks. Thanks a lot for this uh, very enlightening and inspiring uh, presentation. Now we are going to give some room for some uh, questions from the audience. I would like to start just mentioning last week came a uh, report from uh, Harvard, Bus Harvard Business Review when they said something that caught my attention as a person that I'm very aware of, of uh, uh, current discussions about uh, inspiring uh, and, and uh, oh, I guess, oh, it's the air, it's not, the, yeah, <laughs> yeah, the Harvard Business Review was saying that ethical shoppers don't inspire us, they bug us. Ethical shoppers? Ethical shoppers, of course, they were talking about the garment industry and how some people that use garments that are ethical, might be perceived by, by the non-ethical buyers or shoppers as backward, boring, uh, not very knowledgeable about fashion. And I'm asking you if you will see a similar trend about chocolate. Do you like Are we bugging people if we tell them? Do you like my jeans? Not particularly. No? N now I like them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, now this is the G-Star jeans uh, uh, from Pharrell Williams uh, uh, from the oceans. Um, so I th think that ethical source clothing uh, uh, can be the clothing that you want to wear. Um, I don't make all choices the right choices, um, but I think if you do more than doing nothing, you do something, uh, and it's important to do something. Um, and yes, we need to bugger uh, any industry, um, and it's us who can actually tip an industry over. Uh, changing an industry from the inside out is more difficult than from the outside out. Uh, so I think there is a responsibility to, to change that. Um, and some researchers don't see it, and some do. Uh, I am I, definitely one of the uh, people that wants to tip an industry over. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Questions for the audience, please. Just raise your hands. Here, there, and there. Start here. Hi, thank you Hi. for the interesting presentation. Thank I'm you. just curious what you think about the fair trade certification. Um, I think fair trade certification is a really good starting point. It's nothing more than a starting point. Um, if you make chocolate, then it's your responsibility. And most people, they hide uh, behind certification. We are certified, so we must be okay. That's bullshit. You make chocolate, you are responsible for your chocolate. Um, so that, that the responsibility needs to be pulled towards the company, not pushed aside towards the certification body. And no matter whether it's Fair Trade, Rainforest Alliance, or Oots, it's always doing more uh, than nothing. Um, what I hate about certification is that there's no research uh, that a certification body actually has impact. Um, and I like to show that we can make impact. I feel a responsibility over the farmer, and it's not the responsibility of Fair Trade or Rainforest Alliance or any anybody. It's my responsibility to make impact. Um, so we work with fair trade, um, and they don't move hard enough, uh, in my perspective, uh, and they don't make enough impact. Um, uh, so I like it. Um, I like to work together uh, instead of uh, making conflicts with uh, certifying bodies. I think you won't win the race. I like the Tour de France, and if you see the, uh, the cyclists uh, uh, go from the peloton, if they work together, they can win. If they don't work together, then the peloton will come up and convention will win in the end. I hate uh, the fact that the peloton will actually uh, come back. So conventional should never ever win over sustainable. Um, but it's my responsibility to make impact and to show fair trade how it, sh how it should be done. That's, that's how I, what I think. Somewhere there. Take one and then the third here. Yes? Yes. <coughs> Uh, hello, uh, I've been to Berkalbart in um, Belgium on a study visit. A visa. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and as you said, it's the biggest uh, chocolate company in the world, and they told us that they have very like large programs for uh, helping out farmers and making sure sure their kids go to school. Mm -hmm. And so, and I don't think they are lying to us. Uh, they were Why? lying to us, but uh, but the still the reality looks not so good. Mm -hmm. Can you explain this in some way? Um, I, I think Barry Calabar does some really good stuff. Um, and although they invest uh, millions of euros in making uh, cocoa more sustainable, they don't feel the obligation to uh, work with their farmers. You don't own farmers, but you have a relationship with your farmer. Um, and I think one of the mistakes that we have in the eco economic system is that Farmers sell their cocoa to the um, to the government, and the government sells to Barry Calabart. And Barry Calabart doesn't take any responsibility over the farmers. Um, I think you should take more responsibility over the farmers instead of building a school and uh, uh, and some other projects that they do. Um, if you know the farmer who is delivering the cocoa to you, and you make sure that that cocoa is ending up in a bar, and uh, he has my phone number, Mr. Hank, and I have uh, uh, his phone number, uh, Conan, and we work together. He can phone me if there is a, is a problem. Farmers cannot phone Barry Calabar, they don't know Mr. Afrique. 
is the, the in, in charge of Barry Galaba. So if the world is organized in an anonymous way, like commodity trade is, um, then you are never ever connecting to each other. And I think it's important to connect and not to do to build three schools and say that you're doing the right things. Uh, we want to have traceable cocoa in our uh, bars, and Baikalabad was not capable of making that. So now they're going to invest 1.5 million euros. It's only a, a small sum for them, so that they can actually have traceable cocoa butter and cocoa mass in our couverture. It took us three years, and um, it works, but it doesn't go quick enough. So Baikalabad does some good stuff, but it's definitely not there. Thank you for the brilliant presentation. My, my name is Numbisi Tenku, and I'm the program manager of a Swedish-based NGO, mm -hmm. where um, we recently ran a pilot project in my home country, Cameroon. Uh -huh. um, after having understood the cocoa production process, so we saw that one of the processes that involves a lot of slave labor was during the process to fetch firewood to yeah. do the drying. So as we better understood this process, it was because farmers did not master the best fermentation processes mm -hmm. they need to do, which, as you should know, has a tremendous impact on the quality of the final chocolate. Yeah. So we organized a training workshop in which we taught these farmers how to better ferment the cocoa processes, mm -hmm. and the impact was that there was a drastic reduction in firewood needed yeah. by up to 40%. So this means it had to free up the children and the women who are often the ones to take up these processes. Yeah. And the advantage was that we were able to negotiate with the cocoa buyers to now pay for higher prices to the farmers as a kind of incentive for them to also be in the campaign to curb uh, slave labor. Yeah. So I want to ask from your perspective in Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, what are some examples that you've been able to apply to both involve the farmers and the local uh, cocoa buyers? Thank you. Thank you. Um, there is a different process in Cameroon and in Ghana and Ivory Coast uh, because you sun dry the cocoa in Ghana and Ivory Coast and you wood dry uh, uh, it in, uh, in Cameroon. It gives a real uh, strange uh, uh, smoky uh, cocoa uh, taste uh, to it. So the Cameroon is famous of the smoky taste uh, uh, cocoa. Um, what we've done is uh, setting up uh, partnerships with uh, farmers. There was an organic uh, fair trade certified uh, cooperative with 100 uh, farmers, and they were organized to produce for Cadbury, for Green and Blacks. And then Cadbury got uh, 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 acquired by Mondelez, um, and Mondelez said, we're not going to do business with that cooperative in uh, Western Africa. So the Ghana uh, uh, cooperative that was working for four years for, uh, for Cadbury to uh, uh, get certified organic and fair trade certified beans uh, didn't have any, uh, um, uh, any business anymore. And we stepped in and we said, well, those 100 farmers, we don't need farmers yet and we are not capable of doing traceable uh, in into our beans. Uh, into our bars, uh, but we, we're going to work with you. We worked with Abogfa now for three years, and um, if you see the progress that we make, uh, there's a higher productivity, kids go to school, there's a new school, um, there are uh, the uh, cooperative went from 100 uh, members to 500 members, um, the yield goes up, uh, there's now uh, 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 professional management and uh, Stephen is working there as a full-time uh, uh, eco economist, somebody who knows uh, uh, um, how to do the work. And if you, you see what we've realized in three years' time, that's unbelievable. And it makes me proud. The moment I go to Apanoapo and I see the people there, then I feel, yeah, this is impact. And although it's just turning uh, a group of people of 100 to 500, it's now the biggest um, uh, organic uh, uh, cooperative of Ghana, and all the cocoa they produce go to us. And so that's nice. And it's, it's just impact at small scale. 500 people is not changing the world, but it's the lives of 500 people, uh, 500 families. And, and yeah, that's for me, that's, that's what I bring to the primary school in Amstelveen to say to Bente, yeah, the boss of chocolate did something. Two more questions, please. One. 
Thanks for the uh, very interesting uh, con uh, presentation. I was just wondering, you said you would lead by, the company would lead by, by example to um, overcome the uh, child labor. And I was, I, I thought from your presentation, so one thing is to pay the premium price for the chocolate and then it's yeah. the traceability. Yeah. And then it's also what you just mentioned, the very close link between you as the chief chocolate officer and um, the, the actual farmers. Yeah. And my question is, what would be for the bigger company, for the bigger bigger companies, what would be the strategies there that they can easily adopt or that they can adapt? Because I think for Barry Calabout, it would be very difficult for the CEO to, you know, kind of have that strong relationship with the farmers they're sourcing from. Um, but I mean, just to hear your perspective on that. No, I think if you uh, uh, so, we have five uh, five sourcing principles. We call them. Uh, traceability, long-term relationship, 25% uh, uh, higher price, uh, increase of quality and uh, uh, of quantity, and professional management of the uh, the cooperative. And those five, if they all five, not just two or three, if all five are being copied by all the chocolate companies, then I think then there's more prosperity at the beginning of the value chain. And um, yeah, we spoke a little uh, before. Um, if you if you look at Ghana and Ivory Coast. Uh, the small holders are such small farmers has nothing to do with professional farming and there's a big difference between farming in Southeast Asia and 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 the small holder farming uh, that that's going on in Ghana and Ivory Coast and I hate to say it but you have to give the people a, a kick in the butt as well because it's their responsibility to change something it's not the the yeah, uh, and I mean it is it is in a nice way. It's not me as a white nose who's going to tell them how to uh, organize their lives. It's their responsibility, and we would just want to give them the tools to to flourish. So that's uh, uh, I want to make that really clear. There's no help. Uh, there's no free uh, rights. You have to work uh, with us to actually make uh, uh, impact and headways. Um, so I call it always: we pay for play. You play, and we pay. No. Thank you. I know you have a question. Would you be so kind and keep your questions for the panel discussion? We are going, you, can, you are going to be able to pose your question as well. I'll, Thank I'll you. We are trying to keep the time. No, keep your questions and then in the final part, <laughs> and then you get the chocolate. So you don't have no questions. <laughs> Thank you. And applause, please, to Hank for this presentation. Thank you, Hank. Thank you.